Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about what the U.S. military is doing to drinking water in Hawaii. Our guest, Wayne Tanaka, is director of the Sierra Club of Hawaii. Wayne Tanaka, welcome to Talk World Radio. Uh, Hi, David. Great to be here. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for what you've been doing. Uh, For people who haven't been following for a long time now that this has been in the news, uh, what is Red Hill in Hawaii? Uh, So so Red Hill is the name of a um, a small mountain, uh, also known as Kapukaki. Um, Within this uh, hill is a underground uh, fuel storage facility a massive facility it's its original capacity was 250 million gallons of fuel um, unfortunately this facility is also just 100 feet above our sole source drinking water aquifer essentially uh, the primary drinking water source for the island of oahu which has a population of um, around a million people um, and even i guess more traumatically this facility has been leaking fuel since its uh, construction um, in, in the 1940s, and most recently has contaminated our drinking water aquifer, uh, leading to the poisoning of thousands of people, um, both military and civilian families uh, who are served uh, by the uh, Pearl, water drink- Pearl Harbor drinking water system um, uh, that uh, takes water from a well just a quarter mile uh, from Kapukaki, from Red Hill. And this is near Pearl Harbor, I take it. Uh, yes, it's just um, uh, it's Malka of, of of Pearl Harbor, so um, right, right above above the, the bay. And and so are people now, uh, military and civilian, living without uh, a, a normal water supply. Um. So uh, since the crisis began in November of 2021, uh, the Navy has shut down its uh, Red Hill shaft, so drinking water well that served um, this population, about 93,000 people. Um, they've gone ahead and and um, done what they've called flushing of the system, so basically running water uh, through the pipes, uh, through the hydrants, trying to flush out all of the oil, uh, which is kind of a dubious prospect. I mean, imagine trying to wash a uh, frying pan without any soap. You know, like you're always <laughs> going to have water. Like, yeah, doesn't work. Um, yep, yeah, and, and not surprisingly, unfortunately, a lot of folks uh, living on these water lines are still reporting uh, intermittent. Uh, experiences with uh, odors and sheens in the water, um, still having uh, uh, health uh, issues, symptoms like rashes, like gastrointestinal um, um, uh, complications. Uh, and um, it's it's really not clear for many people whether uh, their water is, is, is safe to drink. And, and the fact that the Navy is doing anything is the result of a lot of work by you and many other people, right? I mean, they resisted admitting there was any problem or doing anything about it as long as they possibly could. Uh, yeah, I mean, since 2014, when they reported a, a previous leak of about 27,000 gallons of field, the Navy and the Department of Defense uh, had been uh, adamantly Uh, asserting that this facility was both essential for national security um, as well as uh, that it was being operated uh, safely and in a manner that exceeded industry and regulatory standards. Um, You know, since the crisis began, um, they finally recognized uh, that both of those things are false. Um, They the Pentagon has agreed to shut down the facility. Uh, It's recognized that relying on a World War II era Field depot is not the best strategy, uh, you know, even from a national security perspective, um, and and that they don't even need to construct any new fuel holding facilities uh, to maintain operational capacity, um, which really just kind of, you know, for us means that our our once exceedingly pure aquifer has now been contaminated uh, potentially for decades. Uh, not be, not for national security even, but but simply for uh, a, a military's the military's convenience. But what does that even mean, national security, when you're putting the the safety of a million people at risk? You're you're giving people who live in the nation poison to drink. Doesn't make them secure. So what is meant by this phrase, national security? 
I mean, that's that's absolutely what was driving a lot of us like crazy, right? For the last, um, you know, seven, eight years. I mean, the, 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 Navy, the Navy's own studies showed that there was a, you know, an expected chronic release of 5,000 gallons of fuel a year uh, from this facility. I mean, in 10 years, that's 50,000 gallons, right? Um, you know, the, the, the Navy's own studies also indicated that in any five-year period, uh, there is an 80% chance of a sudden release of up to 30,000 gallons of fuel. Um, and this was before, you know, the crisis happened, before they finally conceded uh, that it's insane to store that much fuel over the sole source drinking water supply um, for any population. Um, and, and, and and as you said, you know, to, to, to assert that this was necessary for national security is, is just, um, uh, it defies logic. And, and so after years of, of resistance and they've admitted there's a problem, uh, they're now slowly just getting around to actually taking the fuel out of the place, right? Yeah, it, it turns out that, um, you know, despite them seeing as recently as, you know, February 2021 that this facility was operated in a manner that exceeded, you know, all safety standards. Uh, that in fact they they needed to to do over two hundred and fifty repairs uh, to the pipelines and the valves and the pumps um, that run this facility in order to to safely defuel, to safely remove the fuel. Um, and because of that, we've been sitting with this ticking time bomb of about one hundred and four million gallons of fuel uh, above our aquifer since the crisis began uh, in November, 2021 until today. Um, and um, the fuel is still there. Uh, we The plans are for the fuel not to be completely removed until January, 2024, uh, which is, you know, every single day there's a sword hanging over our head. And, and, and unfortunately, because of how, uh, how poorly this facility was had been maintained just to do what it was designed to do, it took, you know, over a year, over a year and a half, uh, uh, just to um, bring it up to operational like um, normalcy. And so, is the plan to eventually get all the fuel out and get the storage facility out and clean the place up? And if so, how long will that take? Yeah. Uh, so that's what we've been promised. Um, the uh, plan now is to remove the majority of the fuel um, uh, by. January of 2024. Um, you know, even if all goes well and they do hit that hit that mark, uh, there will still be about 100 to 400 thousand gallons of fuel that remains at the bottom of these tanks because they can't they can't drain them fully. It's an engineering and physics issue, uh, so they'll need to figure out what to do with with that remainder. Um, after that, there's uh, the the matter of um, washing down the tanks, um, flushing the sludge out, which which has you know have a community at the bottom. Um, again, there's no clear detailed plan on how they're going to do that um, and then we have uh you know to to deal with the remediation of the environment and the water um around kapukaki so um i mean anything that stays there is going to be above a drinking water supply um there have been uh, at least uh, 72 what's called unscheduled fuel movements uh in the since the 1940s uh that have released uh, an unknown amount of Feel what we do know is that at least two hundred thousand gallons have been spilled, um, but the that's a extremely conservative estimate because it only counts uh, what the Navy's records um, have been able to quantify in terms of, of fuel spilled. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of contamination uh, that will need to be remediated, and again, there's no real plan, much less the timeline uh, for when that will occur. Is is an unscheduled fuel movement what a normal person would call an oil leak? Uh, it's what uh, <laughs> it's what the Navy has uh, uh, decided to call these um, uh, these fuel spills. Um, you know, they have a very interesting terminology that uh, set of words that they like to use for various aspects of this situation. Intended, I suspect, to do the opposite of communicating. Um, th this is this is not unique, right? There are similar problems around U.S. military bases in in Guam, in Okinawa, and places around the world, right? Oh, well, absolutely, David. And and really, that's you know, if you know, it's one of the things that we've uh, come to realize is that this is not an isolated incident. You know, this is just one. Uh, one more example in a long pattern and practice of uh, military bases really just not being 
good stewards of the of the lands they occupy. Um, you know, as you mentioned in, in Okinawa, there's you know PFAS, these highly toxic forever chemicals that are now showing up in their in their in their streams, in their groundwater, um, in 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 sacred springs and wells. Uh, in um, Guahan and on Guam, the uh, Chamoru folks there are fighting uh, to protect their own sole source aquifer. Um, there's a massive expansion of a firing range uh, of, in Retidian or Latexan uh, that is, uh, you know, going to see millions of of shells expended every single year, um, leaching all kinds of, you know, toxic things into into the soil and and eventually into the groundwater. Um, and they're also contending. Uh, now with a proposal to continue the open burn or open detonation of hazardous uh, munitions um, right on the beach, uh, right next to this aquifer. Um, so you imagine, uh, you know, just taking, you know, several, you know, th 35,000 pounds of uh, munitions, uh, pulling it into a metal container, pouring gasoline on it and then letting it on fire. And that's how they, that's what open burning is called. Open detonation is just setting stuff on the sand and blowing it up. And, and of course, that's going to spew all kinds of, of toxic chemicals into the air, into the into the water, um, into the ocean. And, and it's just, um, it's astounding. Uh, but all, all I have to say, um, it's really a wake up call, I think, for communities across the Pacific and across the U.S. continent to, uh, you know, to, to take a hard look at, at what's being done to the, the very land the very resources that we will need uh, uh even more so you know as we deal with climate instability um and 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 all of the other dimensions of our, our current planetary emergency we are speaking with wayne tanaka director of the sierra club in hawaii wayne the the struggle that you've had to go through in hawaii to get information out of the u.s navy and find out what's happening and and manage to change things uh, has been, you know, absurdly uh, difficult. But some of these other countries that have U.S. military bases in them, the local governments, as I understand it, are not even allowed to know what's happening to test the water. Uh, it's 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 not their right. It belongs to the U.S. military. What? How how difficult is it uh, to change these things in a country where? that's that's outside of the United States. Oh yeah, I mean it's you know Okinawa is a, a prime example of that where um you know even after all of these spills and we've we had uh, uh PFAS like forever chemical was in in fire flooding foam um you know released from from the, from from one of the military bases there and 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 essentially had these clouds of white toxic foam floating around town and, and the, the local officials had to tell people if you see foam don't touch it um and and despite all of that and numerous other incidents of of PFAS releases uh the military is not allowing local officials to uh to test or to, to see records to to confirm a connection between these spills and the PFAS they're finding in their drinking water um in, in the groundwater and streams incredible um also in Hawaii, where there is a shortage of drinkable water now, uh, the Marine Corps is still wasting plenty of it on a golf course. Is that right? Uh, yes. I mean, that's, that's again, again another uh, exceedingly uh, infuriating uh, situations here where throughout this crisis, um, when the whole island was looking at, you know, water conservation mandates, potential shutdowns, um, the, the, the actually, um, several golf courses, uh, on military installations were using polyble drinking water, um, for irrigation purposes. Um, you know, I, you, uh, the Marine Corps base in Kanyuhe that you, uh, just, uh, alluded to, you know, uh, they are supposed to be using recycled water or R, R1 water, um, for whatever reason, they switched back to polyble, um, during this crisis. And that's, um, now causing all of uh, ecological and cultural issues um, in, in the region, in the region um, where um, you know these uh, you know very uh, significant um, traditional agricultural practices and, and fish ponds, all these things that rely on uh, fresh stream water flow are being hampered because of the groundwater extraction um, um, by by the marines to use specifically for a golf course. It's uh... 
slightly off topic, but I just want it, it just always strikes me as bizarre every time I think about it. Isn't it also the case that at Pearl Harbor, where uh, a, a, a ship is left sunk uh, some feet in the water, uh, it's been leaking oil into the water for decades, and they just let it keep leaking, and the tourists go and look at it and remark on the beautiful colors and the sacred oil leak of Pearl Harbor. Uh, it's as sort of some perverse war propaganda while the oil <laughs> is flowing into the water. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think that's just a testament to the, uh, you know, just different worldviews of, of, you know, um, Pearl Harbor or, or Pu'ulo, as it was traditionally called, you know, that was like a, a breadbasket. It, it was an extremely rich, extremely prized uh, region in terms of fisheries, uh, in terms of local EO. There were dozens of these local EO or fish ponds um, that helped, that fed communities, you know, um, and uh, unfortunately, the, the U.S., military uh, took a look at this lush and bountiful space and thought, well, a wonderful place to put a, a, a coal fueling depot and then, a, and then a Navy base. And and um, now you look at it today, it's a super fun site. Um, you, I mean, there's beyond the, the fuel leaks, there have been all kinds of uh, releases of, of, you know, radioactive material of, of, um, of PCBs and, and, and other things that have now rendered this bread basket into, um, unfortunately, a, kind of a toxic soup how much of that is the result of of the bombing of the japanese planes and how much just the ordinary result of u.s military bases yeah i mean i uh yeah and, and i mean i can't i can't um quantify the relative sure uh things but again you know like the, the this um, military industrial complex has been having impacts both direct and, ind and indirect on these islands, um, you know, since, uh, you know, the overthrow, um, since the U.S. Marines helped to uh, forcefully um, take over the, you know, the, this internationally recognized uh, Hawaiian King government, um, and then subject the islands to, you know, several decades of uh, oligarch, like quite frankly, an oligarchical um, uh, control uh, by the plantation industry. I know there are people who would like Hawaii to be independent again, um, uh, and there are certainly people who are trying to do what's needed to clean up the water supply. What what are you working on, and and what are what are people uh, trying to accomplish on Oahu? Uh, well, with respect to um, <clears throat> Kapukaki, uh, you know, we're, I mean, we're all collectively holding our breaths right now. Um, the the defueling um, is going to commence, you know, in October uh, this month, and then, um, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue through the beginning of next year. And and if, you know, if something goes wrong, um, what we, we've experienced, what we're experiencing now um, would, as, as, as difficult and challenging as it as it will be for the next few years, you know that it will be dwarfed by the potential impacts. And so, um, you know, uh, beyond you know, like praying for everything to go right, you know, we are preparing uh, disaster uh, uh, preparation toolkits, um, trying to make sure that you know everyone's aware of what is going on, um, so that if there is an incident, that we can all respond appropriately and keep each other safe, um, and then. You know the big the the big thing in, is that not the big another thing is that uh, again this the feeling process is just the first step in a years long um, uh, uh, I guess a path to really resolving the current crisis. So um, we need people to not let up the pressure that has gotten us this far, um, even if the feeling is is accomplished uh, successfully because you know not only do we have all of the uh, you know the other closure and remediation uh, issues that we have to contend with um, we also need to figure out how to replace the water sources that were contaminated um, or that are at risk of contamination that's going to take years and years and millions of dollars of monitoring wells sentinel wells new drinking water sources um, um, and um, you know there's there's all these health crazy health impacts are still ongoing. Um, you know, there's hundreds of people that are still reporting symptoms and, and some are like extremely sick and, and, and essentially on the verge of poverty because they've been searching 
uh, for answers for, you know, it's unfortunately there's not a, a ton of information about what to do when you're poisoned with jet fuel and, um, and all the, the, the additives that are, that are in it. And so, um, you know, people are spending out of pocket for tests for, you know, for, you know, um, save art treatments and, and that's, that's forcing them to, to, you know, like sacrifice so much. Um, uh, and so there's that um, aspect of it. And, and then um, I wonder why there isn't money for those people when there's well over another hundred billion dollars to send weapons to Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan and the border of Mexico. It isn't there, aren't we rolling in money? It's, I mean, it's a rounding error, right? To, like just to, just to help these folks avoid, you know, the, the you know, the worst aspects of, 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 of um, you know, financial insecurity and, and, and housing insecurity, um, you know, the Pentagon, you know, I can't imagine why the Pentagon can't allocate some temporary relief. I mean, even though there, you know, there are, there are claims that are being litigated, that's going to take years, um, years and years to be resolved. Um, especially the way the uh, the Department of uh, Defense and Department of Justice attorneys are are, are fighting it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just the. I mean, I, why can't we just have some human decency? You know, for the very, the very families that have sacrificed. Um, you know, so much in, in the name of quote unquote national security and, 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 our, and our defense. I mean, I know that in, in Okinawa, the local government uh, stands up to the Pentagon, says, we don't want any more bases, close some of the ones you've got, takes their concerns to the United Nations, you know, but the, the national government of Japan and the national government of the United States couldn't care less. Does the government of Hawaii ever stand up for the people of Hawaii against the the damage done by U.S. military bases? Um, I mean, I think I think the challenges we've had trying to get our local elected officials um, to take a stand prior to November twenty twenty one is reflective of you know the huge amounts of political deference. Um, that's given to the military here. I mean, they, you know, they are a, a big part of our economy. You know, you know, billions of taxpayer dollars are, are spent on on military activities here in the islands, and so with that comes a lot of political capital. Um, fortunately, you know, with with this crisis and with the massive uprising um, that brought together, you know, folks from all walks of life, that brought together, you know, military families and demilitarization advocates. Um, you know, that that that's also. I think convince some of our legislators and elected officials that they have to take a more critical look at, at what's what's being done um, um, to our islands, to our to our water, to our lands, the, the things that we're really going to need if we really want true security, um, especially in the climate era. It's it's actually I think tell me if I'm wrong or what your view is, uh, Wayne Tanaka, but it, it's actually fairly rare for environmental groups and peace groups. To work together on something, even though the military is such a huge destroyer of the environment and such a sinkhole of funding that could be going to save the environment. So that like my local Sierra Club, where I live in Virginia, works with peace groups and other groups on all kinds of good issues. But big environmental groups like the National Sierra Club, you won't see within 10 miles of a, of a peace event, usually. Um, what's what's your perspective on that uh you know i i think the national Sierra club has you know it's been going through a, a transition a transformation right um we you know there's been discussions uh fairly deep discussions recognizing you know the the roots and the legacies of of, of the national Sierra, Sierra club and um you know it didn't come from from the you know the best intended places and like a number of if not most American institutions, you know, the, these these roots are, are are bound in legacies of of you know white supremacy and and racism, and, and so um, there's a reckoning that's ongoing. Um, you know, with big organizations, it's there's all of um, uh, uh, inertia or or yeah, it takes a lot to to move these things around. And so um, you know, hopefully, you know, we can all kind of help define uh, the work and identity of 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 the the big green organizations. Do you think that that this will open up some organizations to working for for peace uh, in addition to acknowledging past racism? Uh, I mean that, that that's that, that, 
that's the hope um i mean just you know war is so incredibly destructive i mean not just i mean to human lives obviously but also to the environment um and um and uh you know like there's you know if it's hard for me to reconcile advocating for the protection of our lands and waters and and, and um, for the protection of our earth uh without also recognizing the role that um institutions like the department of defense plays um in accelerating our our um yeah our, our the destabilization of, of our of our planetary climate yeah it's very hard for me too. Um, we we've got just a, a few minutes left. What can people do to help uh, who are concerned about what's happening uh, with Red Hill or anything else? And and how can people stay informed with what's developing there? Uh, well, definitely visit our website sierraclubhawaii.org. Um, uh, that's Sierra Sierra Club Hawaii um, the org, and you can. Um, sign up for action alerts, you, re, you know, read our newsletter about the various campaigns we're working on. Um, for folks who want to help some of the uh, victims of the uh, poisoning events, there's uh, redhillcrisis.com, um, and that'll showcase some of the some of the families that, um, you know, are probably in the most dire straits uh, who, you know, we've been trying to find financial support for. Um, and otherwise, you know, look, think, just remember, don't let what's happened to us happen to you. So think about where your water comes from. Think about what happens if you don't have access to clean water. And then and then take a look around to see, you know, is there something that could be threatening our water supply? Who is doing anything about that? And then and maybe joining up with, with those folks. Would be would be good if there were a list of where there is uh, where there are poisons stored just above uh, aquifers and water supplies, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, you start with a list of military bases, unfortunately. Um, if you Google PFAS and, and um, you know, United States um, you know, military, then you'll, there's, there are actually maps showing where um, they've been finding these forever chemicals and water supplies, and, and, and a lot of it is associated with um, um, military facilities. Lines up with military bases, just like Superfund sites <laughs> line up with military bases. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, yes. Wayne Tanaka, thank you for everything that you are doing. Uh, we have been speaking with Wayne Tanaka, who is director of the Sierra Club of Hawaii. We will put the website links up at talkworldradio.org. Wayne, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Yeah, thank you so much, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.